Hey everybody, Mr. Judson here. Happy New Year. Um, so right before break, we uh, were talking about the second derivative test. Um, and that would tell us where our, our function would be concave up or concave down. And so I think they'll start us off today with the same idea. We want to be able to find a point of inflection and then discuss the concavity. All right, you guys go ahead and try it for this one. All right, so to, to find the uh, point of inflection and discuss concavity, we need the second derivative. First derivative is going to be a cosine of x, and derivative of cosine would be a negative sine of that angle 2x times the derivative of the angle, which would be 2. And so I think, you know, as, as you work with this, working with uh, messy angles is, is not always the easiest thing. Um, it's, it's always good if we can remember some of those identities to be able to change that. So uh, this is a double angle formula. So the sine of 2x is equal to 2 sine of x cosine of x. And so if I change that over, I would then have y prime equals a cosine of x minus 2 times 2, that would be 4, sine of x, cosine of x. And now I need the second derivative. So second derivative, if I take the derivative of this, that would be a negative sine of x. Here I'm going to have a product rule. There's my first piece, there's my second piece. So take the derivative of the first, you're going to get a negative 4 cosine of x times the second piece. So I'll make that a cosine squared. And then leave that the way it is. So minus 4 sine of x, take the derivative of this, which would be a negative sine of x. That makes that positive, And we now have sine squared. So if I factor a, a 4 out of here, let's see. Can I do? Oh, no, I'm not going to get sine squared plus cosine squared. This will be negative. So what I need to do now to set this equal to zero and solve, as to find the point of inflection, it'd really be nice to have this all as one trig function. And so we remember the Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, which means a cosine squared is equal to one minus sine squared. I want to take that and substitute it in for that cosine squared. So that means I now have a negative sine of x minus 4 times 1 minus sine squared of x plus 4 sine of x, sine squared of x. And then as soon as I distribute this, I get a negative sine of x minus 4 plus four sine squared of x plus this four sine squared of x. And so now what I have is eight sine squared of x minus a sine of x minus four. There's my second derivative. So to find a point of inflection, I need to set that equal to zero and solve. So let's see, does that factor, I know if I do 8 times 4, that's 32. And are there two numbers you can multiply to get 32 and add or subtract to get a negative 1? I don't think so. So that means to solve this, we have to go to the quadratic formula. Ooh, this just got ugly. Let me, let me just erase all the work here and just keep this one Piece. All right, so I'm setting this equal to zero and solving. So that means that the sine of x, so, you know, just like if this was 8x squared minus x minus 4, and I use the quadratic formula, well, x would equal negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I just don't have the variable x now. I've got the, the, the trig function, sine of x. 
So this is equal to opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times ac, that would be a negative 32, all over 2a. And so that means I'm going to get 1 plus or minus the square root of, this will be 128, positive 128, plus 1, that would be 129 over 16. So it might be easier just to go with a, a decimal number. So I've got 1 plus the square root of 129 divided by 16. All right, so there's my first answer, 0 0.772. Or if I do the same thing and I change this to subtraction, then I get a negative 0 0.647. I'm just going to real quick store these two values in, in memory. Um, I'm going to call this one A and this one B. So what we're saying is that the sine of x is either going to equal 0 0.772 or the sine of x is going to equal a negative 0 0.647. So in our, in, our, in our book, they're going to give us a, a range of values. This one, they wanted us to take the interval from 0 to 2 pi, which means I don't care about negative angles. I just want positive angles from 0 to 2 pi. Now remember, these aren't angles yet. This is just what the sine is equal to. It's this x value that I'm really trying to solve for. All right, so now I'm going to do inverse sine. This is stored in A, so I'll go second sine of alpha A. And what I get is x equals... 0 0.883 radians. Now let's, <laughs> this, this is forcing us to go back and think of our um, you know, trick stuff we learned last year. If, if I have a unit circle and, and my sine value is positive at 0.883 radians, okay, so I know this is 1.57 right, half a pi. So 0.883 radians is going to be somewhere right about here. If I go across the unit circle, the value of the sine is also positive here. And so to get this angle, I know that this uh, 0.883 radians, that we go from zero up to here, I've got to do that same distance right here. So I really want to do pi minus that number to get my other angle. So pi minus that answer. Got it right up there. So there's what I get. And that is 2.259. Radians. We don't have to write radians, but I'm just writing it so that we can keep all this straight in our head. And then I need to know where is the sine going to be a negative value. Right? Well, I know the sine is negative down here. It's my y coordinate. So I'm going to do, clear this off, I'll do second sine of that number is stored in b, so alpha b. And there's what I get, a negative 0.704 radians. So this, this is really forcing us to think um, our domain is from 0 to 2 pi. We're not interested in negative angles. So I have to think to myself, if I go in the negative direction and, and stop, you know, 0.704 radians, what would that angle be had I gone this way? And so what I want to do is I just want to think, go all the way around to 2 pi and then back up. 
that many radians. So really 2 pi minus that last answer. Um, which since it's already negative, I'm going to go plus, go up and get that. So now I'm adding a negative, which means subtract. And there's what I get, 5.579 radians. So that would have been, as I go around this way, that would have been the second angle that I found. I would have found one over here first. So I'm just going to write that down here, 5.579 radians. So let's see, if I go back to that negative 0.704, okay, so I'm backing up this way to get to that same y value over here, that negative 0.704 radians, I've got to do that right here. So really that means pi plus 0 0.704 radians. So pi, let's see, if I want to add, I'm just looking at the number up here. It's already negative, so I'm going to say let's subtract that negative number. Right? When you subtract the negative, you really end up adding it. And so there's what I get, 3.846. Yeah, so that made us think a little bit. So what I have so far is four different answers that I now need to do my second derivative test. If I'm going to discuss the concavity, um, I need to make the table and show that. So just to remind you guys, um, we, we said this uh, before with our first derivative test. You have to make the table, okay? I saw people's homework and, and people were taking shortcuts and that's one of the things I said. Don't, you know, don't take shortcuts. Everybody do it the same so we're all doing exactly the same thing. I don't want to have to stop and, and spend 10 minutes trying to figure out what someone's doing because they chose to do it different. All right? So we, we need to make that table. All right, so here are my intervals. So we're starting at zero, and the first angle I would hit would be 0 0.883. And then I would go from that angle to this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten these up. I'm just going to go 0 0.8 to 2.3. And then from 2.3, the next angle I would hit would be this one. Call that 3.8. And then from 3.8 to 5.6, and then from 5.6 to 2 pi. And remember, these angles are in radians. I want to pick something easy to work with, so I'm going to go pi over 6. If I just check that on the calculator, pi divided by 6, 0.5, okay, we're in the interval. But this pen is horrible, you guys, I'm sorry, that's, that's 0 0.8 right there, 8.83. Um, yeah. Uh, this angle was right here, the next angle is right here, so a good number to choose would be pi over 2. And then I'm going from this angle down to here, so pi would be a good number to, to test. And then from this angle over to here, so 3 pi over 2. And then from here up, um, I'm thinking if I went, uh, what would that be, 11 pi over 6? That's one tick mark below the x-axis there. Those are going to be my easiest angles to plug back into the second derivative. So as, you know, when we took the second derivative, um, we, we never really had this in, in a factored form. Um, so this is one of those problems where I, I think what I need to do is I just need to take these angles and plug it right back into this thing. And, and remember, I don't really care what the answer is. I just want to know, is it positive or negative? 
because if the concavity changes, that's where you have a point of inflection. Now, um, let's talk about something real quick. Calculators. You get to use uh, a TI-84 on your central Washington final. Problem there is most people don't have those, right? A few of you I know own your own. Um, so we're going to have to set up a checkout time for you guys to come in and get um, a calculator to be able to use on the final exam. Okay? We probably, by the time you watch this, we probably already talked about that. And, and so uh, um, we'll, we'll get that taken care of. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to store, uh, one at a time, I'm going to store these angles into the variable x. And I'm just going to type that in exactly the way it is. So I'm going to go pi over 6. Oops. So pi divided by 6. We're going to store that in the variable x. And now I'm going to do 8 times sine of x squared. So remember, you have to put the, the trig function and the angle down first parentheses around the whole thing, and then square it. You can't write it this way on the calculator. Okay, minus sine of x, minus 4. And what I see is I got a negative answer. All right, so that tells me that this is concave down. Some people were using just up and down arrows here. I know I can figure out what that means, but again, I really want us to all do this the same way, okay, so that we're all thinking the same. All right, store my next angle, pi divided by 2, store x. So the nice thing here is I just have to go back up and hit enter right here, get the expression and hit enter again. Answer is 3, so that's positive, so we are concave up. Now I'll take pi. Store that in x. Go back up and get that expression. <clears throat> and I got a negative 4, so we are concave down. I'll now take 3 pi divided by 2. Store that in x. Go back up, get my second derivative, evaluate it. I get a positive 5, so we are now concave up again. And right here, 11 pi over 6, store that in x, go get the second derivative and evaluate, and I get a negative number, so we are now concave down. Alright, so I know there's a point of inflection wherever the concavity changes. So there's a POI here at 0.8. 8, 3, comma something. There's going to be a, a point of inflection here, concavity change from up to down. So at 2.259, comma something. And there's a point of inflection here at 3.259. 846, comma something. And we've got one more point of inflection at 5.579, comma something. So now what I have to do is I have to take each of these angles and plug them back into the original function to see what the y values are. The question was to do two things. One is to find the point of inflection. The second thing was um, to discuss the concavity. Okay. I don't think I wrote that down, but that's what our directions for today will say. I'm going to stop there because you guys can plug these back into the original function <clears throat> the same way we tested these numbers in the second derivative. Okay. Remember, our original function was y equals 2 sine of x plus the cosine of 2x. So we just have to store that in x and then type in the original function. All right, that was kind of a long problem. Let's try one more. All right, so 
They're going to give us a few problems in this uh, section that will force us to think a little bit, which I, I know is painful. Um, but what they want us to do is, if, if this is the original function, they want us to draw a sketch of what we think f prime of x and f double prime of x look like. What does the first derivative look like? What does the second derivative look like? I'll let you guys think about that for a minute. All right, so here's, here's what I see when I look at this. Um, there's a, a relative maximum right here which means if I'm going to graph the first derivative, it has to equal zero wherever there's a relative maximum. And there's a relative minimum here. So wherever you have a relative minimum, that's where your first derivative equals zero. And then what I see is in this interval, my function is increasing, right? We're increasing as we go left to right. Then we start to decrease, and then we increase again. So right there, that's really my first derivative test. You know, how do we know when a function is increasing? That's when the first derivative is positive. So it should be above the x-axis. How do we know when, the, when the, a function is decreasing? It's when the first derivative is negative. So it should be below the x-axis. So I'm guessing that the first derivative looks something like that, f prime of x. See here my y values in the first derivative are positive. That's what we do when we do the first derivative test. When we make that table, we're looking to see where the, where the sign of the, of the derivative is positive, and that's where the function is increasing. Here my first derivative has to be negative because the function is decreasing. And here my first derivative has to be positive because it's increasing again. And wherever you change from you know, decreasing to increasing, that's where you have a relative minimum or a relative maximum. Now someone might also look at this and go, well, isn't that just a, a cubic function? So if you take the derivative, you should get a quadratic, which is a parabola. Good, good to think that way, yeah, but not every problem will look like that. All right, now I need to draw f double prime of x. So let's see, I did this one in red. I will now do this one in blue. So once I take the second derivative, so now think of the, think of the red function. What, I, what I'm really doing is taking the derivative of the derivative. Right? There's a tick mark right there. So if I'm taking the derivative of this red function, I know that at a relative minimum, the derivative of the red function should equal zero. The second derivative is also where a point of inflection happens. That's where we change from concave down to concave up. See, I'm thinking about all these ideas that we've talked about. Since this is concave down over here, it means my second derivative should be negative over here. So negative y values. Here we're concave up, which means my derivative should be positive y values. So really, any line going through the origin would work for f double prime of x. Okay, I don't really care what the slope of this is. I'm, I'm not going to look at that and go, oh, no, no, you got the wrong slope. You probably do have the wrong slope, but we're just making a sketch, an estimate of what we think that looks like. There it is. I'll give you guys another one to try. All right, so here's another one. I've, I've got this function that, that kind of goes up. It's increasing until it hits a high point right here, and then it decreases, and that's f of x. So what you guys need to do is draw f prime of x, and f double prime of x. Okay, go ahead and try it. All right, so, you know, again, I look at this and I, I know that when I draw the first derivative, wherever that equals zero, that's where you get relative maximums and minimums. There's a relative maximum, so my first derivative should go through the x-axis right there. 
And, and now I'm just going to think about the slope. You know, here we're increasing, which means we have positive slopes. Then we start to decrease, and we've got negative slopes. So my first derivative should be positive over here, negative over here. And, and you know, if this is an asymptote, really the slope is pretty close to zero out here. Then it starts to grow a little bit, but eventually it starts to level out, and it starts getting smaller again. It gets closer to zero, because that's what the slope of the tangent line is up here. So I think this is going to look something like this. And then it's going to do the same thing down here, but just negative. Okay, we're decreasing all the way along here, which means we get negative y values in our first derivative test. Here we're increasing, so I should have positive y values. And it seems like right about here and right about here. This is where I'm increasing the most. This is where I'm decreasing the most. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to do the second derivative. Looks to me like there's a point of inflection right about there and there, okay, which means that happens when the second derivative equals zero. We are concave up right here, then we're concave down, so we've got to be negative, and then we're concave up again. So my second derivative is going to be negative here, but positive here and here. And, and again, if I think, okay, the second derivative is really the slope of the, the red graph. Okay, there's my relative maximum right there. There's my relative minimum. Might be off by just a little bit. Um, here I have a very small positive slope, but then it goes negative. Doesn't really get real large. Still negative, and then it goes positive again. So I think this is going to look something kind of like that. So this this will get close to the asymptote as it keeps on going. Same thing over here. I mean, there'll be a, a high spot to this blue graph. All right, there it is. First and second derivative, f double prime of x. All right, let's try something different. All right, so this problem's a little bit different. They're going to give us some information here, and they want us to sketch what we think this graph would look like. So let you guys just kind of read each of these, try and think about what it means, and, and then see if you can draw a picture of what that graph looks like. All right, so um, I guess the first thing that I see here is that they're giving me some zeros, right? Plug in a 2, you get 0. Plug in a 4, you get 0. That means we're, we're hitting the x-axis here and here. And so then this statement says the first derivative is greater than 0, which means it's positive if x is less than 3. So 3 is kind of a, a dividing point here. I'll just put a dotted line in there for a guide. Um, my derivative is positive when we're less than 3. That means this function has to be increasing. Right? We're undefined at 3, the first derivative. And the first derivative is negative when we're greater than 3. So that means we have to be decreasing over here. Now, could it be something like an upside down parabola? Well, no, because then the derivative would equal 0 at 3. That's not undefined. Undefined means there's something weird happened there. There's either a, uh, an asymptote or maybe there's like a sharp point. When I say a sharp point, I mean like, like this. See, this would be increasing undefined because where, where's your tangent line? You don't really know, and then it's decreasing again. So, so this graph would meet those conditions. So would this. Increasing and then decreasing. Since we don't really know which one of those is happening, then 
either one would be okay. Um, the second derivative is greater than zero. That means we're concave up as long as x does not equal three. Well, these pieces are both concave up, so are these. So really, either one of those can work. So I'm just going to draw a graph like this. Now, why, why did I choose that graph instead of this one? No special reason. I just did. If you would have chosen this one, you'd be equally as correct. All right, let's try another one of these. All right, so you guys go ahead and try this one. All right, so, so again, they're, they're telling us where some zeros are located. Zero comma zero and two comma zero. So we have to hit those two points. And it says here that f prime of x is less than zero, so that means negative, if x is less than one. So I'm going to put a dotted line here again, just at x equals 1. To the left of that, our derivative is negative, so we are decreasing. f prime of 1 equals 0. That, to me, says there's a relative maximum or minimum here, because the slope of the tangent line is 0. And once I get larger than 1, then my derivative is positive, so we must be increasing. So I am decreasing, then increasing. So if I'm trying to decide, is it a maximum or minimum, if I'm going down and then up, that's the one I want to choose. So I think this graph looks something like this. And I haven't even gotten to the last statement yet. Here it says that your second derivative is always greater than zero. It's always positive which means we are always concave up, and, and this graph shows that. Now, you know, one of the questions here is, how do you know where to put the vertex? Like, what if I would have put it down lower? And, and the answer to that is it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it's at. As long as you have a parabola that opens up, and it goes through these two points, and your vertex is here at x equals 1, anywhere, um, then you're good. All right. That's what we have for today is uh, a little more work with the second derivative test and, um, you know, then trying to, you know, do some problems where they make us think a little bit more. Really, we're thinking about the first and the second derivative test as we do these. Um, it's just can we translate that information into a, a graph. All right, let me get you guys an assignment. All right, so here's what we have for today. This is uh, assignment number 15. We're in week 15. Um, page 197, uh, we're going to do 27, 30, 34, 35, 39, uh, 51, 52, 53, and 56. Um, these three right here, these first three, will probably be the ones that take the most time. Um, or maybe it's just the first two. These are trig problems. And so they're, you know, they're a little more involved because you've got to find the angles at which um, the derivative equals zero. All right? <clears throat> but the stuff here at the end should go a little faster. This is kind of like our, you know, here's some information, draw the graph. Here's a picture of a graph, draw what the first and second derivative look like. Um, I think these are just polynomials. So they'll, they'll go a little bit quicker. All right, that's it for today, you guys. Um, Again, Happy New Year. Welcome back to school. And um, we'll have a, a lot of stuff that we're going to have to kind of pay attention to and, and take care of in the next few days just to get ready for our Central Washington Finals. So um, be looking for that information. All right. We'll see you later. Stay safe.